Paul. Commissioner Ackerman. Here. Commissioner Briggs. Here. Commissioner Sove. Here. Commissioner Hammerschmidt. Here. Commissioner Milstein. Here. Commissioner Abrams. Here. Commissioner Mills. Here. Commissioner Gibrandel. Here. Commissioner Woods. You have a quorum. Thank you. Um, do we have any introductions this evening? We do not. Um, approval of agenda. Do you have a commissioner that will move the agenda? Moved by Commissioner Gibrandel, seconded by Commissioner Mills. Uh, any discussion or changes to the agenda? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? It's approved. Uh, minutes of previous meeting. Uh, before us this evening, we have the January 22nd, 2020 meeting minutes. Do a commissioner to move? Moved by Commissioner Abrams, seconded by Commissioner Gibrandel. Any discussion or changes? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? It's approved. Now we come to reports from city administration, uh, city councils, planning manager, planning commission officers and committees, written communications and petitions. We'll begin with our city council representative, Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, one update for you all from our meeting last night. Uh, 2260 Traver Road, a single family um, parcel of about three and a half acres was annexed into the city. Do we have a report from the planning manager? We do not. Planning commission, officers and committees. Commissioner Gibrandel. I think we've talked about this before, but I just want to put it out there again that um, on February 22nd, we're going to have our big kind of climate summit um, for the city. And that this is a chance for people to be able to hear about uh, the um, potential strategies used for achieving carbon neutrality by 2030. It will be at Pioneer High School. I think it starts at noon, noon to five, I think is what it is. And it is a chance for people to be able to weigh in on which strategies they like. There will be kind of a series of TED, um, TED Talk style presentations. And it's a real um, opportunity to be able to influence the direction of what we may see um, as we try to meet our um, very ambitious climate goals. Any other reports from committees? Commissioner Mills. I just thought I'd report that the ORC did meet last week and we discussed two items of business. One was um, allowing solar energy on carports and what that might look like. So I think that that's something that will probably come back to um, all of us. I think that's close. And then the other thing that we did is started a discussion about what sort of benefits count in our planned project um, at, towards plan project modifications. And so that's one that I think we'll probably, the ORC will be talking about a little bit more before it comes to a working session or it might come to a working session first. But that, that one, you know, kind of going through the list and figuring out what we pull off and what we want to pull on um, is, uh, was on the agenda. Any other reports from any committees? Uh, various, various correspondences to the city, city Planning Commission. Uh, we have actually quite a bit that we've received in the last, um, since Friday. So please take a look at that. Um, we now move on to audience participation. This is a time for any member of the audience to address the Planning Commission in regards to any item that is not on the agenda. If you have an item that you'd like to discuss that is not on the agenda for discussion this evening, please step up to the podium, state your name and address for the record, and you'll have up to three minutes to address the Planning Commission. Hi there, Noah Hoffman, 1765 North Bridge Drive. So um, I spoke to the Planning Commission a couple weeks ago, um, and I'm coming here to talk about the proposed ordinance to regulate short-term rentals. Um, I want to give a little bit of an outline because I think the last time I spoke, and I apologize, there wasn't all that much context for what I was talking about. So I wanted to give a little overview of just what's happened, and I'll try and do it the best I can in a couple minutes. So um, to the best of my knowledge, back in mid-2019, there was one constituent in Ann Arbor who had a bad experience. She lived next to somebody who decided to rent her house out on um, a short-term rental site. There was an issue, and so she kind of took it upon herself to create a movement, which we're not really sure that it actually has much backing, but she started a website called Ban, Ban A2 Airbnb or something like that. And Ultimately, there was so much backlash against it that she changed the name of the website to legislate Airbnb. And that was a common trend that we found um, 
the next step was that she lobbied, lobbied city council. Um, she decided to go to Derek Delacourt and other city council members calling and calling and calling and asking for them to do something. And so finally, uh, they decided to hire Carlisle Wartman Associates, a consultant, and put out a memo after holding three public meetings. At those three public meetings, the, uh, all three of which I attended, um, the overwhelming majority, and I think the numbers were roughly 50%, 25%, and 15% in the following order of do nothing, so don't regulate, uh, do very little, so include permits and inspections, um, or do a lot, which is specifically banning the uh, short-term rentals that are not someone's primary residence, right? So 15% roughly is who supported that idea. Thereafter, uh, city council in November received a memo from Carlisle Wartman, which in our estimation grossly mischaracterized the situation of short-term rentals in the country. One specific data point to this is that they said that four or five representative cities, so 80% of cities in the country, ban non-primary resident short-term rentals. And that's just simply not the case. If you, if you look at a uh, list of cities of representative ones like Ann Arbor, so Royal Oak, Columbus, Ohio, those are good examples that they decided not to include. Those ones explicitly allow it. They have a great permitting process. It's very safe and above board. And they decided not to include it. Finally, city council decided to pass a resolution in early January that would allow for the framework of an ordinance that was based around banning these short-term rentals. And as somebody who's been doing it, following all the rules for the better part of a year and a half, um, I'm a little bit confused about what happened. And I don't really understand why they're moving in this direction. Um, because zoning is a part of this, I come before you to ask and just kind of explain this process. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, this is Jeff Hugh, uh, 111 North Ashley Street. Um, so I actually kind of wanted to talk about the same issue, but kind of from a different perspective. Um, I'm a resident physician at the University of Michigan. Uh, I just wanted to take a couple, couple minutes to talk about the short-term rental issue and how it can affect us as a medical community, but more importantly, how it affects uh, our patients uh, that we have the privilege of taking care of. Um, when I started medical residency this past year at the University of Michigan, um, I was totally new to the area, didn't have a place to live. Um, like many of my fellow residents, I was moving across the country um, and was unable to visit apartments until I moved here uh, a few weeks before we started work. Um, so during that, uh, during the time when I moved here, the first couple weeks, uh, my family and I stayed in an Airbnb, um, and during that time, we were able to find a, a permanent residence. Um, another way the short-term rentals impact our community is during uh, medical student away rotations. Every year, uh, a large number of fourth-year medical students come to Ann Arbor um, from across the country to do two to four week away rotations, um, which are essentially auditions with different departments at our hospital. Um, in my experience, the majority of these students uh, who don't have a friend to stay with in the area, who don't know anybody in the area, um, appreciate the convenience of renting an Airbnb that's close to the hospital, especially because they'll be working uh, pretty long hours um, for, for several weeks. Um, with regards to our patients, uh, the University of Michigan Hospital is a major tertiary care center uh, and serves patients all across uh, Michigan and uh, Ohio. I treat patients every day who've come from hours away to receive care from people who are experts in their field. Um, many of the patients and their families have mentioned their use of Airbnbs um, as they come from uh, faraway cities uh, and they're here to prepare for major surgeries and life-changing procedures. Um, they've, they've mentioned that they appreciate the privacy um, as opposed to staying in a hotel, especially uh, you know, when they're staying with their family and are about to undergo something that could, could change their lives. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to thank you guys for taking the time to listen and uh, hope that you um, consider the repercussions of potentially banning Airbnbs in our city. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thanks for hearing me again. I'm Carol Scala and um, I live at, well, our, our home is at 1524 Marion. Um, I just wanted to ask you guys to fast forward a little bit in your thought process. I know or I think that you haven't probably received 
any written documents from city staff on this, so you have no framework to <clears throat> even really start considering what you're going to do. Um, but I think um, it's going to come, and it's probably going to come as was recommended by council. And I would ask you to consider a couple of things um, that I think we really haven't talked about too much. And one is enforcement. If they require and request a total ban on non-owner occupied Airbnbs, it's going to be really difficult for the city to enforce this. I, I don't even know, you know, you would need a registration system of some sort, and then you're going to have to hire somebody to actually track um, the Airbnbs and find out about the ones that aren't registered and and then what's going to happen with them and I, I don't It's going to get really complicated and the other issue is the zoning. I mean are we going to end up having to rezone Ann Arbor because We've got student rentals and long-term rentals mixed in with short-term rentals in residential areas where people are saying that they shouldn't be um, so it's really complicated, and I don't think it needs to be this complicated. I think that there are cities who have already done the homework um, for Ann Arbor, cities like Columbus, Dublin, Ohio, did an extensive review. I just emailed Alex this evening um, a copy of their report, um, and they, they have opted virtually to do nothing because they didn't really identify a problem. Um, and so I think that there was some work that needed to be done by council, not by the consulting firm, although the consultants were hired to do this work, but we didn't get a very good report. Um, the work should have been done before it came to you, before it went back to city staff to draft something. Um, people were not looking at the cities who actually have successfully um, come up with a reasonable plan that benefited both sides of this issue. Um, the mayor of Columbus actually said that it was incumbent upon the city to balance the benefit of short-term rentals against public safety. That, that was the only thing that they were considering was public safety. And we have ordinances in place and laws in the city to deal with public safety and there has been no proof through the police department that short-term rentals are a public safety issue in this city. So I just think we need to be looking at some of the examples of the cities who have done it and are doing it well um, as, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Tom Stahlberg, I'm a Lower Town resident, and I don't know if you're all aware, but we're just now settling uh, the lawsuit, resolving the lawsuit uh, against the city for improperly rezoning Lower Town to a campus business district category. So where is the campus business district? How is it defined? How can it grow or migrate? And who gets to decide that? If the U of M buys more property like Fingerly, does that instantly change the boundaries of campus and in turn our zoning boundaries? If the U of M rents a cluster of buildings, is that campus? What about North Campus? What about the Argus Complex in the heart of the Old West Side? Does that U of M complex permit campus business zoning for 415 West Washington? How close do you have to be to be near campus? And does this mean the U of M controls the boundaries of our zoning districts and can alter the city's zoning ordinance without the city doing anything? Can someone else have a campus, like when we had Cooley Law School on Plymouth Road? What happens to our zoning boundaries when that campus closes? So the answer is very simple. None of that matters. The boundaries for campus business district are not defined by a radius from a single building or cluster of buildings. It's not North Campus. It's not the medical center, especially not a satellite building that's not part of the main medical center. It's not defined by, any, by the U of M in any way without input from the city. We make our laws. So the campus business district what is it? It's the gown part of our town and gown downtown urban core area. Our planning documents say that it is essentially along the South University Avenue, along with streets immediately abutting that to the south and the state and Packard intersection. 
It is not anything simply called campus. It's the campus business district. And it isn't merely defined by physical location, but also by character. Urban core zoning categories have requirements and standards particular to the character of an urban core. Picture either the town or gown urban core, and certain things make sense, like small front setbacks, zero side yard setbacks, but those things don't make sense in a neighborhood. Urban core characteristics usually include uh, things like taller heights, greater density, less parking, and more flexibility and mixed use. So you picture the herds of undergrad students walking down South University, going to class, finding a place to eat or drink. Our planning documents and zoning codes support such an urban core. And we differentiated our town and gown urban cores from the other areas of the city. C1A and C1A are our core area zoning categories. While a case could be made to stretch the boundaries a little, perhaps to immediately adjacent properties, that would have more to do with the expansion of the urban core character, not the sign of a U of M building or something like that. The character of these categories are specifically designed for urban core areas, just like D1 and D2 are. They are not to be used elsewhere where that character and the standards and requirements of those zoning categories do not fit. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Nick Wilkinson. Um, I live at 1115 Fountain Street. Um, I'm just here to kind of talk about the banning of short-term rentals. Um, I own one full-time Airbnb uh, short-term rental property, um, and I have uh, I've introduced myself to both of the neighbors and have good relationships with them. Um, and I, having running this property as a short-term rental actually produces income, which I think it's very difficult for people that are just getting into um, buying rental properties as an investment or a business in Ann Arbor to actually make any money because the properties are so expensive and, and so are the property taxes. So um, this allows me, it produces income for me and my family and it allows me to stay home some of the days with our new daughter. Um, on the, on the other end of that, I also own a traditional duplex um, that has normal traditional tenants. And I think the smartest business decision that I could make is ending their leases and turning them into short-term rentals because right now it's, it's not really producing much of any income and I'm putting in a lot of work for nothing essentially. Um, so I don't, I haven't done that and I don't think I'm going to, but it's, something that I've definitely considered. Um, so it's about, yeah, it's, housing is not affordable in Ann Arbor, so it's, and, and that's one of the arguments is that these are taking up um, inventory for rentals, but um, I think short-term rentals should be regulated because right now it's kind of a free-for-all, um, but having some registration and Thing is a great idea, but totally banning them, I think, is is probably not the way to go. But that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, uh, my name's Alex Gross. I live at 758 South Maple, and uh, a lot of people have already spoken to this, so I don't want to take up too much more time, but. Um, I came to speak, so I figured I would get up here. Um, and yeah, same kind of thing, just that I have a place that I work with with my mom, and I help a few other people manage around town. And uh, yeah, it's just, you know, you make life decisions based on what you think is allowed, and you spend a lot of nights and weekends working on it, and uh, you know, it's just wanting to come here and kind of make a personal appeal that, yeah, I hope that there will be a kind of a reasonable approach instead of putting us kind of among the most restrictive cities in the country. And it seems like you know all the hosts that I've talked to, um, including the ones here, like like they said, you know, we're all for kind of reasonable, you know, registration and taxing or whatever it is. But um, yeah, just that. Yeah, it's hard when you make decisions, and so I kind of want to go up and just kind of give like a again a personal appeal. And I think, um, yeah, there's like people said tonight, there's a lot of advantages both in terms of the people coming to the city 
and really kind of not the, the disadvantages. So, um, yeah, thanks for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to address the Planning Commission? All right, seeing no one, we will move on to uh, public hearing scheduled for our next uh, meeting, which is our next regular meeting, which is February 20th, 2020. A public hearing will be held on Thursday, February 20th at 7 p.m. for 3874 Research Park Drive site plan for City Council. A proposal to demolish the existing building and construct a 79,000 square foot research and office building on this 5.63 acre site zoned RE Research. Access to the site continues from the southern adjacent site. And now we are on regular business. The first item is the Garnet Plan Unit Development and Site Plan for City Council approval. Our procedure for this evening will be for the petitioner to have up to 10 minutes to address the Planning Commission. Uh, we will then get a staff report followed by a public hearing and then discussion and a vote. So we will begin with the petitioner. Good evening, I'm Brad Moore, architect for the project. You may remember us from a previous machination of the project and also from the PUD uh, pre-submission uh, meeting that we had uh, before this body. Um, this is uh, I an identical, for all intents and purposes, proposal to what this body uh, recommended City Council approve previously under a different uh, zoning classification. Um, it was um, determined by enough of the City Council members that uh, they did not feel that the previous uh, proposal for the zoning designation of C1A uh, was appropriate. And most of those city council people who expressed that opinion also expressed the opinion that they liked the project. They just would rather it come back as a PUD. Um, and so that's why we stand before you tonight. So I'm just going to run through the project to refresh memories that may have lapsed or uh, gone cold over the course of a uh, year practically and I know there are a couple of new people here who didn't uh, see the project the first time so let me just run through this is a um, location map uh, you may be familiar with this old Michigan site here the new DTE proposed site there and that's uh, Depot Street the train station is uh, just uh, kind of northeast of us um, how do I advance this Jill just Click. Just roll, roll the wheel. Roll the wheel. Ah. There you go. Okay, so here we go. Here is a, a plan of the building sitting on the site. The site is on the corner of Broadway and Summit, and uh, also on the corner of Summit in, a, in an alley that goes uh, between Summit and Depot on the west. This is a, a first floor which shows the relationship of the building to the site. It's not exactly a rectangular site because Broadway is at an angle. Um, <coughs> the site slopes um, from the southwest corner down t towards the northeast corner. So there's a diagonal slope across the site. We've nestled the building into that slope to create a below grade parking level below the building and then place the residential levels on top. Here you see um, a residential level layout at the first floor where there's a single dwelling unit on the east side of the building and two dwelling units on the west side of the building. All of the units have been developed with large outdoor uh, living spaces because even though today may not be an example, we do get nice weather occasionally. <laughs> um, and it's nice to be able to sit out on a patio rather than just having some place for a tomato plant. Here, you'll have a place to go out and sit and enjoy. Um, this is the lower level, the basement, the garage. It's tucked underneath the building. <coughs> you may recall that in an earlier version that the Planning Commission saw, uh, we had uh, more vehicular parking and less bicycle parking. It was uh, suggested by the planning commissioners at that time that we try to maybe get rid of a parking space and, uh, and add more bike parking, which we did. So we now have, um, in addition to the four uh, on-site um, Class C parking, we have a total of 19 um, bike parking spaces in the basement for a total of 10 units in the building. And there is opportunities uh, for each of the people who have a parking space to also uh, hang a bike over their hood if they want even more bike parking. Um, and they could also uh, reorganize. We, we've shown a lot of these bikes as um, just a regular horizontal hooped type. There are more efficient ways of double stack um, 
type of arrangements. If, if, the, if the condominium owners uh, want to do that, they could even put more bikes than that. But we have almost two um, per, per uh, dwelling. Um, this is the second floor. This is the third and fourth floor. The third and fourth floors step back. You can see on the western side, the boundary of the two lower floors is here. Um, on the upper floors, the building steps back from the alley so that on the top two floors, there's only two dwelling units. And then we have a roof plan here. We have proposed a green roof um, for most of this roof surface, uh, which will um, not only help contain stormwater, filter it, reduce the heat island effect in the city, but also be a, a pollinator friendly environment um, up on the roof. This quick site section. Um, these are the uh, 2D elevations. Show, uh, this shows, this is looking from summit northwards. So you can see how the building goes up two floors and then steps back. So it opens up on the western side here. You can see all of the outdoor living spaces. Um, we've made a few changes from the previous iteration in that uh, in talking to potential buyers, we changed some of the fenestration patterns. So the grill works a little bit different in the windows from the last. Essentially, the windows are the same size. Um, they just have slightly different grill work patterns. And we also changed to a more decorative railing style than just the pure linear railings. Um, so this would be the east elevation looking west. And this is the north elevation looking south. Again, you can see how the building steps up. Uh, this is the alley elevation. This shows the garage door going in underneath the building. That is the trash uh, room door, so the, the trash carts can be moved out. Here's a color <coughs> version of the south elevation from looking north from um, Summit. Uh, the brick color has changed from a more red brick from the previous version to a more Chicago common style orange brick, not brown. Um, <laughs> and, the <coughs> and, the, and much of the trim has gone to a deep uh, green as opposed to a brown. Um, the owners were trying to, again, incorporate a little bit more of the color into the building. This is also the same color scheme on the east elevation, on the north elevation, and on the west elevation. Uh, we envisioned the door going into the garage to be um, smoked or uh, you know, cloudy glass so that we get some natural light coming into the garage space, whereas the door to the um, garbage storage area would be solid. A quick uh, 3D elevation from uh, the complicated intersection there of um, Beaks and Broadway and Summit um, uh, looking at the building. Again, this is a little bit more rotated as if you were heading uh, up towards the Broadway Bridge. And I think that's the last slide we have. Um, I hope that's adequately described the um, project, 10 residential units. Um, we have uh, 11 true parking spaces that meet all the dimensional requirements of, this, of the city. We have a couple of m m smaller uh, vehicle storage areas, so we could actually get 13 vehicles in the garage downstairs, 19 bikes downstairs. Um, and I think that's as good a des quick description as I can do in the 10 minutes allotted. Um, I can go into some other details about the projects and how we ended up here. And I'll kind of save that for the public hearing, I think. Um, and if you have any questions, we also have our civil engineer here. So if there's questions about stormwater or runoff or um, removing the environmental contamination on the site, we can hopefully answer all your questions tonight. Thank you. Thank you. move on to Ms. Thatcher for the staff report. I think I'm just going to use these slides because they are pretty much the same slides that I have. Um, so very quickly, um, let's see. So there are certain requirements for all PUD uh, zoning district uh, applications. Um, the first is just the application that requires a bunch of history on the site, um, surrounding land uses, how it's consistent with the master plan. Um, one of the threshold requirements is that um, uh, for certain applications that have a residential component that is beyond the base zoning requirement, 
um, and there's a little bit more on that in the, in the staff report, um, but it does require a, 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 an affordable housing contribution or units, um, and that is a get you in the door to the PUD that is, does not count toward your public benefits. That's required of all PUD projects that meet that threshold. Um, there are also beneficial effects that are required. These are in 529.10F, Standards for PUD Zoning District. I've listed them in the staff report. These are not, uh, if you look on the third page of the staff report, at the top, A through G, these are not inclusive. These are just examples of the kinds of benefits um, that could be considered um, as being uh, beneficial to the entire community and therefore uh, making the PUD an appropriate uh, kind of zoning district for this site. Um, then uh, there are supplemental regulations provided, and they also list uh, the public benefits to the community that are provided by the project. The, the supplemental regs in this case um, basically propose to match or slightly exceed the, the, the current zoning. The floor area is bumped up from 150 to 200 percent. Um, the setbacks are the same as the previous petition. They're just codified in the supplemental regulations uh, instead of as conditions to a different zoning district. Um, there are two landmark trees on the site. One is proposed to be removed. The other one would be mitigated for. First flush stormwater management is required, and that will be captured by a green roof. Um, and no infiltration on the site will be allowed because it is a highly contaminated site. And the petitioners have, dis have agreed to make the parkland contribution of $6,250. The land use element of the master plan recommends a future land use of commercial and office for this block. Residential, of course, is, is uh, appropriate under the current zoning district. Um, and staff's comments, uh, so the proposed PUD site plan meets all of the development standards in the proposed PUD zoning district. What they're showing here absolutely meets what's proposed in the supplemental reg regulations. So staff believes though that the PUD zoning does not meet the first of the standards for PUD zoning district review, which is the beneficial effects to the city um, that cannot be achieved in any other zoning designation. There was some confusion about this earlier today. Um, in the staff report it says that the benefits described by the application could be achieved in the C1A zoning district. The staff is not suggesting that this should be zoned to C1A. We've already been down that road with conditions and it, it was denied by city council. It's just saying that there is a threshold that you have to cross that says you can't, this is a PUD because you can't achieve this anywhere else. But in fact, this could be achieved as a C1A. Um, uh, the project definitely has merits. In the first go around, staff supported it. It's appropriate size and scale and use for the, si for the site. Um, it, it has a lot of good things going for it. The problem is that it just doesn't meet the, the criteria for public benefits um, that a PUD project requires, in staff's opinion. Um, I, am, uh, I am interpreting code here and whether or not I believe it meets it. Um, and so that is merely staff's opinion and uh, the Planning Commission and Council will possibly interpret it the same way or differently. But um, that's when, whenever staff reads code and does not think that it is met, they cannot, uh, they cannot um, recommend approval of a project. Doesn't matter if it's what chapter of city code it is, it could be any of the staff reviewers. Um, but in this case, planning staff does not believe that this meets the thresholds for a PUD zoning district. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to open up the public hearing on this item. Any members of the audience may address the planning commission for up to three minutes. Um, please state your name and address for the record and you'll have up to three minutes to address the Planning Commission. Good evening, my name is Chris Crockett. I live at 506 East Kingsley Street, not far from this proposed project, and I'm also president of the Old Fourth Ward Association. Tonight I'm speaking on behalf of the association. Last week we had a board meeting, and unanimously our board, 12 members, uh, who, are, who make up the board of the Old Fourth Ward Association, agreed that this is a good project and we would like to see it built. Personally, I have been working with Kelly for a couple of years now. She showed me this project when it was in the conceptual stage and I agreed at that time that it looked like a really appropriate project for the North Central area, which is adjacent to the Old Fourth Ward Historic District. 
This project was rejected by city council, which re recommended that it come back as a PUD. So you can't imagine our amazement when we read the staff recommendation for denial. It's the same project that was passed before. And city council recommended that it be a PUD. There are a number of criteria that should be met or can be met, but not all of them have to be met. This is a handsome building. It's appropriate in design, size, and scale for the North Central property owners area. It's appropriate for our residential area. And we like this project very much. It will bring a dozen or more residents uh, to our neighborhood. And we are happy to see that, especially on a piece of property which is not being currently used as residential. It's no surprise that it's luxury development. All Ann Arbor development is luxury development. But what astonishes me is this is a building developed by a local woman with local money in tribute to her mother, who was the pioneer woman developer of Ann Arbor. It's astonishing to me that so much leeway is granted to big, deep-pocketed projects with lots of out-of-town money and out-of-town architects. And yet, this is being looked down upon so much by our planning department with a local woman paying a tribute to a local woman in producing a beautiful building that's appropriately placed in a residential area. I urge you to pass this project. I think that the planning department on this occasion is in error. This is a good project, it's a beautiful project, and it deserves to be, to be built. Thank you. Good evening all. My name is Julie Ritter, I live at 920 Catherine. I'm a member of the Old Fourth Ward. ward. However, Old Fourth Ward Board, but I'm speaking for myself tonight. I sent an email earlier today that listed seven things that are reasons I think it should be approved as a PUD, not as C1A. I'm not going to repeat that here, but it included things like usurping the master plan process, detrimental environmental impact, the fact the city is legally constrained from mandating affordable units and other things. And I'm not going to repeat that. This has been there have been numerous condominium developments in Ann Arbor in the last 10 years on all kinds of property, all shapes, all sizes, all places. Side streets, main streets, through the block, into the hill, none of them had any more public benefit or any more of the long list of qualities that staff has used to justify the rejection of this PUD zoning than this beautiful property that we all really like. All of those condos went through with barely a whisper I've not had the opportunity to investigate the zoning of all the condos, but the fact that this tiny little lot in this residential neighborhood, the staff, the only zoning that staff can come up with is a campus zoning with unlimited height, it would be laughable if it weren't so egregious. It's pathetic. And to blindside this young woman developer who we should be lifting up and celebrating and instead being treated miserably it's clearly not about the zoning for this well-designed and thoughtful development. It's about another agenda. I can easily guess that it's aimed at sidelining the upcom upcoming master plan process at excluding neighbors and others from engagement and comments. It's an agenda of aggressive densification and it's completely incompatible for this site as I've stated and others have stated as well. Please override the staff recommendation and approve this as a PUD. And if you can't approve it as a PUD, choose another zoning that's a lot more appropriate. Thank you. Hello, Tom Stolberg again. Uh, I do live at 1202 Traver Street, which is in the lower town area. And as you've heard before, um, my neighborhood uh, sued the city over using campus business zoning where it doesn't belong. And I'm going to focus on that aspect of this here. I do understand uh, some of what staff said, um, the, the points that staff made about the PUD. Uh, I hear you. And um, I'm a developer. I've 
joined my family business 28 years ago. So I'm a second generation developer. My father's an attorney and developer. Uh, this was dinner table talk for us, zonings and rezonings. And I presented before uh, city councils, planning commissions, township boards uh, throughout Oakland County. Um, so I just give you that background so that I'm not just some guy from the neighborhood talking. Um, so what I want to talk about is why C1A isn't a good bar to compare this to, whether or not you want the PUD. That's one issue, and it has its own specific points. But you can't compare it to C1A. C1A is off the table at this location. This location is not valid for C1A because it's not the campus business area. And it's, C1A is off the table for this area because the character of C1A does not match the character that's appropriate for this location either. Um, if you're going to do C1A, why not C1AR? It's the companion district that to C1A that is specifically residential, where C1A's intent is commercial. Uh, you could do residential under C1B, so there really isn't a need, if you want to look at it that way, for to go to C1A. Just because the numbers and letters are close doesn't mean those two categories are close. They're very different categories. The um, in a rezoning, uh, one of the things you're supposed to demonstrate is why you have to rezone it. You know, where's the error? Where's the change in circumstances? Um, and that's not recognized if you talk about C1A at this location because it can be developed residentially right now under its current zoning. So again, the, the, I just don't understand using C1A just because you can make this building fit C1A doesn't mean that's the appropriate bar to compare this project too. Um, we look at um, what's the big problem that's going to happen if we went C1A at this location. It's not whether they're going to sue or not. That's up to them. It's small potatoes compared to the city. If we go campus business zoning, C1A or C1A are at this location, the city's setting them up for a, yourselves up for a lawsuit, similar to a cottages lawsuit or the Weber uh, Peters building lawsuit where you are not going to have a chance to win. Your city attorney is going to tell you that you're going to lose and you're going to have to not fight it because some big pocket developer is going to come in with a C1A or C1AR. You're all going to be horrified at it and you're not going to be able to say no. We cannot let C1A and C1AR out of the box. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, I, I'm going to speak as a representative of the developer. Um, so I don't know if I get my three or five. You'll have to decide. Technically, you've already had ten. But that was for the presentation of the project, not for the public hearing. Right. right. Because th what I want to speak to now is uh, some of the stuff in this data report. So uh, I'll try to get it in the three so it won't be an issue. Um, I understand um, that, um, you know, when you look on paper, that there's a theoretical um, application of a C1A. Um, but we have to deal with the real world, and, and, and in the real world, there's not enough uh, people on city council who believe that C1A is appropriate for this site. So um, I, I would counsel you to realize that in the real world, which is where we have to function, C1A, we tried it. It was told, we were told it's not going to work. We couldn't get the votes to, with the project. So we don't believe C1A um, is a viable uh, path because we've been shown that it isn't. Um, in terms of the beneficial effects, um, the zoning ordinance lists that uh, physical characteristics, design features, or amenities proposed shall have a beneficial effect to the city in terms of public health, safety, welfare, aesthetics, or convenience, or any combination of these. There's definitely a public health benefit here because we're removing tons and tons and tons of contaminated soil through the project. And then we're putting down a, a, a vapor barrier to, to prevent water from leaching into the, any remaining contaminants and pushing that towards the river. So there's a definite public health benefit from this project moving forward as a PUD in, in reduction of contaminants in the city and migration of contaminants. Um, <coughs> it is, uh, uh, we think it qualifies under uh, aesthetics because we have used a palette of materials that are common to the district. Um, and thus enhancing uh, the neighborhood um, as opposed to using, you know, corrugated metal siding or some other uh, material that was not aesthetically compatible with the neighborhood. It certainly qualifies under the convenience for the people who will live there because <coughs> in addition to the bicycle parking we provided, they don't have to have a car to, to move around the city. These people will be able to live downtown, use public transportation, 
reduce their carbon footprint. Um, all these beneficial effects accrue to the, to the project, and we've outlined those in our application. Um, in terms of the affordable housing contribution, you may remember uh, when Council uh, told us to bring it back as a PFD in August. Um, the basis for calculating um, the residential densities of a project and therefore the contributions required was based on the underlying maximum density allowed in the zoning district that was the underlying zoning district. There is no maximum underlying zoning density in this district. If you could have a 10 square foot um, apartment, you could have 85 of them on, on the project. So we looked at uh, what it would cost as a contribution for a single unit of about 700 square feet. That calculation was 88200 and that's the amount of money that developers have proposed to contribute towards the affordable component. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to address the Planning Commission in regards to this item? See no one, I will close the public hearing and I will read the motion. The Ann Arbor City Planning Commission hereby recommends that the Mayor and City Council approve the Garnet Plan Unit Development PUD Zoning District and Supplemental Regulations, PUD Site Plan, and Development Agreement. Moved by Commissioner Mills, seconded by Commissioner Ackerman. And we are in discussion. Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you to the members of the community and to the development team for coming back out tonight. Uh, thanks to, to Ms. Thatcher for her review. Uh, I'm not going to speak too much to the substance. I think there are hours uh, of footage online of us deliberating this very site and this very project. Um, so feel free to, to log online and, and watch all of it. Um, I do want to set some tone and context. Um, but first, I, I do want to address some of the comments uh, made towards city staff. Um, we have a tremendously professional civil service here in the city of Ann Arbor who does their jobs exceedingly well and in response to the direction of the elected body city council. Um, I, I think Ms. Thatcher and her team did a good job and, and an appropriate job in this case. Uh, while I don't agree with their findings, uh, I think it was professionally prepared and delivered. Uh, to put any conspiracies to, to rest, um, Planning staff attempted to get this project to the finish line, and in fact, they did. And City Council, a group of elected officials, voted it down, giving this very direction. Um, so to say that city staff was working to uh, harm or to delay a local developer um, while affording other luxuries to out-of-state developers is, is not fair. So I just want to set that record straight. Um, now back to my uh, intended comments about tone and context. Uh, this is a good project. It was a good project when we saw it as C1AR. It's a good project as a PUD. Um, I voted for this project twice, and I will be voting for it twice again. Um, I think it's a good project because it places residents closer to where they work. It's within a walking proximity of the two largest employers in the county, uh, two of the largest employers in southeastern Michigan. Um, that takes cars off the road. When people can walk to work, that takes cars off the road, which reduces congestion and emissions, something that we all strive for. Uh, it respects the Carytown and Old Fourth Ward's historic character uh, and its design uh, and its building materials. It cleans up a contaminated site, uh, and it offers green features like a large number of bike spaces, um, a green roof, and energy efficient design. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, I'm sure colleagues have comments or questions, uh, but I, I intend to vote for this tonight. Commissioner Mills. Thank you, and thank you for letting me follow Commissioner Ackerman, who said most of what I was going to say, but far more eloquently than I could say it, so thank you. Um, I, I, come to the same conclusion in terms of, I think, the standards that we have. I, I don't disagree with the staff report, but I think that um, the remediation features, or the, the site remediation and the green roof in itself are beneficial here. Again, I, I go back to the record. I thought this was fine the first time we see it. I think it's fine the second time. I really have questions, though, about the affordable housing contribution, and both between the staff report and, and kind of what was just said, like what is that, I know what the PUD calls for, um, that, it, that if, if it exceeds the underlying, you know, density that, um, 
that there should that it it must <laughs> uh, there there must be a contribution and so can you help us understand how you arrived at the number I've got the way that I would have arrived at it hmm. but I want to hear it from staff too sure hang on one second while I find that small piece of paper all right so the underlying zone the underlying floor area density is is 150 percent um, this beauty request is for 200 percent because that 50 percent difference is larger than 25 percent they are required to um, provide the equivalent of uh, or provide 15 percent of the floor area uh, and apply that to the affordable housing ratio what you get is 15 percent of 10 units is 1.5 units times 120, oh, what's the dollars per square foot? Hang on. I don't have a calculator or I'd do this backwards. 186, that doesn't sound right. Here, 126. It's 126 dollars per square foot times 1.5 units times the average floor area of the units which in this case was 1,470 something square feet. That's how the number in the staff report came about. Clear as mud. <laughs> Is that the same? So the I I the kind of how you arrived at 15% at basing it on the underlying FAR because there is no overall housing density. It's really Correct. in the in the C1B which it currently is and in the PUD it's effectively as much as you you know as as many units as you can get into that square footage. Right. The existing maximum residential density uh, there is no maximum and there is no minimum. Right. So yeah. if they if the building proposed would have been 150 FAR then or, or sorry yeah 1.5 FAR like then there would be no there would be no exceeding the underlying density. So I get right. how that is the 40. Six, I think, because it's 196. Right, right. 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 So right. the 46 divided by 150 it gets you. It's 31 percent over the underlying FAR. So like that puts you into the territory of needing to go, needing to provide 15 percent. You actually if, have to go all the way to 200 percent because that's what the PUD supplemental regs say. Ah, thank you. All right. So then, yes, you're at you're at 33 yep. percent then, right? Yep. Um. So the and so that's how I that's how I write it too. The the number the one hundred and twenty six dollars per square foot is set not in our zoning ordinance, but that's by council in a different document. Is that right? Yep. And that was most recently updated in August of two thousand nineteen. Got it. And the and the the one point five units kind of is making sense. Yeah. That's that's the the fifteen percent of ten units. 1.5 units and then does is the average floor area because I think that that's one of the probably what some of the difference is right is the, is the decision to multiply it by the average square footage for a unit is that spelled out in the council resolution about how you calculate the contribution in lieu or that is now part of code that was adopted by City Council in November Got it. Um, that's a different that that's in the that's in the PUD um, section of code, uh, not in that's not part of the affordable housing resolution that was passed by council setting the the rates, et cetera. Got it. So the app, so the so that number is it's in here and um, okay because there were there's a couple different like I I, I guess I'm unsure at this point what exactly what kind of contribution they are supposed to be making. Because I understand because they, because council asked, it instructed them to go the PUD route, mm -hmm. that what comes along with that is a, a contribution to, or, or providing affordable housing, right? If it, if it exceeds the underlying FAR, that I don't dispute that. I think that that is the correct interpretation. I guess what I'm unclear about is I the petitioner is saying one number and I've read something different in the staff report and then there's a letter that says that provides both of those numbers. So I'm confused as to what it is right now. So 
uh, something that the petitioner said made, thing, made more sense of this to me um, tonight. They had proposed a number uh, that was 88,200, and that comes from the city council um, August resolution. It was an example of one way uh, using 2018 numbers, a different method of calculating um, an affordability gap in, 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 in housing. It's, it's, it's spelled out in the city council resolution um, for a unit of 700 square feet using 2018 numbers. It's just an example. It's not what was adopted. So just, just so you can clarify, it. we were, we were um, not approved in August. That was the only number that was available in August when we were told to proceed with the PUD. Mm -hmm. um, that was the number my clients went back and ran through their financial calculations and determined they could make the project work with that donation. The subsequent changes which came in November were not what my clients had anticipated when they were told by council in August to make this path. And in, in point of fact, you, you may remember I referenced that 88,200 number uh, on October 15th when we were here for the priest's middle conference because that was what was available in August. Right. And, there, and there, it wasn't November yet when they... Precisely. Right. So that's, yeah. there's the discontinuity yeah. is what has happened over time yeah. between when council said, no, go this way, and then when council adopted a new formula in November. Yeah. Got it. I don't know. Um, yes, please Just jump one, in. Like, one I more thing to, <laughs> to clarify one more piece of this. The November ordinance changes clarified the ordinance. They didn't change it. They clarified what had already been going on with using floor area in residential projects, in zones that aren't zoned residential. It didn't change anything. It just clarified the, the, the method to that to make it easier for people to sort out what to do with underlying residential zoning and what to do with all other underlying zonings if you're building residential. Got it. And I realize that that doesn't make a whole lot of sense right now unless you're actually looking at both of them, but, um, it, but it was really meant as a clarification. It did not change the code or the method that had been used previously. Got it. So this has got to be frustrating. I mean, because it's, <laughs> I, I, let's, it's got to be frustrating, right? This is something that, like, um, the building hasn't changed, right? But, but in order to use the zone that you were instructed to use, there are criteria, right, that you have that have to be met. Um, and like I said, the the this is where I would disagree with staff in terms of I think that there are some additional um, benefits that are provided by this building that honestly were offered the first time around, right? I'm just saying like it's above and beyond what was required the first time around, the, the remediation and the green roof, right? And so I think it's a legit to count that as the benefits towards the PUD. But I think the thing that we have to sort out is the, is the affordable housing component. And from my perspective, like that's what we require of all PUDs, like I, I don't see a way, and I don't think, I wouldn't want to set the precedent of changing that. I don't think, again, I would have approved, I did suggest to approve this without that, and so that's what's really frustrating because adding $200,000 onto the top of this does nothing to increase affordability in Ann Arbor. Sure, it's adding money to our affordable housing fund, I get that, but it's making these units more expensive. So this is something that I'm, personally struggling with, and I'm sorry that I'm channeling my, like, <laughs> unfortunate, like, that, that this is the kind of place that we're at. So I don't know how, um, what we're voting on tonight. It's, it's making the assumption of the calculation of 200, the 200 number that you came up with, with the, that the staff came up with based on what's in there. And the, I guess the question kind of to the, to the petitioner is like, do you still want us to go forward? Like, can you still actually do that? Because I don't see how we can change that. So the project can't happen with a size of a contribution at that level. There, there's, that's a negative profit for the developer. They're, they wouldn't be able to do the project. So it would mean zero units. 
Got it. No affordable, no nothing. Yeah. I, I um, so, yeah, what I'm just saying is like, I, what, we're, what we can vote on is what it, what's in there now. And I would say that if we're gonna be consistent in applying this, I do think that there's the benefits, but we need to be consistent on the affordable housing. So I think it meets the affordable housing. I will plan to vote yes. I, like, again, would have voted, you know, I did vote yes last year. So um, those are my comments on it. So Ms. Thatcher, um, so what we are voting for, I just want to be clear, the, the, the number is 200 and so per the development agreement and per our report, $279,078 is what's going to be contributed to the affordable housing fund. Is that correct? Yes. If city council wants to address that or any other changes to this petition, um, that is up to them. But really, the, that package is what you all are voting on tonight. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Abrams. Um, but we're voting on that, but the petitioner is telling us that that number is not acceptable, but we disregard that input. Or I just need a little guidance from yeah, staff about yeah. this. So, I don't know how to. So um, it, 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 this body can't change city code. You can. Right. And, and yes, there is a disconnect here between what the developers would like to contribute and what the formula is saying they need to contribute. So, but, but what they need to contribute and what's in the development agreement and what's in the staff report is what um, is, is, is the starting place. Because again, you can't change what's right. required by code um, as the planning commission. Right, so does the petitioner want us to vote on a proposal that includes a $279,000 contribution. That's what, that's what we're voting on. If that's what you have before you, you'll have to vote Mr. On. Moore, microphone. Uh, if that's your only option, yes, please vote. Okay. I, I, there would be an option to table, potentially, right? Or you still couldn't change it. Well, right, it is what it is. By law, it is, the number is what the number is. I suppose it would give... Yeah, an opportunity for the petitioner to, some, yeah, that doesn't, okay. Um, so I am, I'm one of the new faces <laughs> that you referred to earlier. I wasn't here the first time that this came before the commission, so I've been trying to sort through the backstory. And I just wanted to make sure that I understand correctly that there's a lot of talk tonight about C1A, but it's actually, C1A is not on the table as far as I understand it. It's currently zoned C1B. And the reason why C1B is insufficient wasn't, addressed tonight, but my understanding is that that is because there's a building height limit to C1B of 50 feet and four stories. And the application for the PUD is so that you can build a taller building. Is that correct? And the, and the limit on the total floor area? So we, the At C, 150. Yeah, 150. Instead We're of 200. We're exceeding 150. So it's the, those two parameters that, unless Jill has other input, those are the two parameters that and, well, and, the, and the setbacks. Is it safe to assume that at, with those restrictions, the developer would not build this project? Correct. Correct, okay. Um, okay, that, that's it for now, thanks. Commissioner Ackerman. Thanks, um, question for Ms. Thatcher. On November 4th of last year, city council passed a set of uh, zoning reforms aimed at helping affordable housing. Mm -hmm. The PUD uh, change in the formula was one of those. Mm -hmm. Also in the implementation of that ordinance, we talked about um, allowing projects that were already in the pipeline to continue mm -hmm. with regulations as they existed prior to, to November 4. Yes. Would this be included in that? It, it would not. We figured that out today and emailed it to the petitioners. I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me but the effective date was um, I think 10 or 15 days. The, the, there was an effective date of the ordinance. There was a number of days um, within that date, which you could, Brad, do you have it with you, the email? Um, I don't. It, um, uh, okay, it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't 
meet the, the bandwidth that City Council laid out for projects that were already in the works. When was this submitted? So that's November the, 20. So let me, let me just address dates, right? So we had a pre-submittal meeting with staff on the 23rd of August then to set up the pre-petition conference before this body, which was the next step in the PUD on the 15th of October. And then, the, then with the blessing of both the staff and this body, we then submitted the application for site plan approval and rezoning in November 19th, I think it was. I think that the date of the adoption of the change or clarification, depending upon semantics, of the calculation, the formulae, happened between the pre-petition conference that we had here mm -hmm. and the formal application. So it really depends on what you define as the pipeline because there's no way to get to that application process until you do those other two first steps, which are outlined in the code. So we actually began the steps in August and then we, the next step was in October and then the final step was in a date in November, which was after a time when the council changed or clarified the formulae. So what, when we are in the pipeline is what it boils down to. I think, th thank, thanks for the clarification. Um, that's really unfortunate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Among a long list. Uh, that's really unfortunate and frustrating. Um, this is a good project um, and neighbors like it. Um, I think if we vote to, to recommend this, Ms. Thatcher, is there any way that we can give direction between now and when it appears on a city council agenda to, to figure out some way to get closer to that 88,200 number? I, I don't know if it's by re-examining submission date and what the definition of that is. I don't know if it's, uh, I think that's probably the, the best legal route, but yeah, we've, we've looked at that. We're happy to go over it with the city attorney's office and get their opinion on it before yeah. it comes back. Um, it may be a difference in definitions of when a project is accepted. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to open the floodgate to every single petitioner in town saying that there can exist under the old zoning code because it's mm -hmm. much more permissive when it comes to affordable housing, but uh, this this uh, this is really unfortunate. Um, so I think my preference would be if we do, if we, I mean, either way, we're gonna move this forward uh, either as a denial or a, or a recommendation of denial or approval. But um, I think some direction also to, to staff to, to speak with the city attorney's office mm -hmm. um, to try to get closer to that 88200 um, as governed by law prior to November 4th. Commissioner Mills. As I said before, I'm totally fine with that. Like, the, I would, the only, the only concern that I have about sending that um, kind of message overall is there's been a lot of talk, I think, particularly as we, as it relates to our one or, or sorry, C um, C one A is about precedent setting, and I worry about precedent setting of changing the affordability formula. So I again, I don't want like if there's if this if this fits that loophole just right, and this is like the one thing I I think I I don't want to stand in the way of that. I think that that makes a lot of sense. I want to make sure though that. We know what our PUD is about, right? And and what PUD is supposed to be for. And if there are, as you just recommended, or as you just noted, like if there's if we open it too wide and it and it or it sends the message that this is something that can be skirted, that's not what PUD is intended for. Like that's that's not that's not its intention. So I want to make sure that that doesn't set an, an unfortunate precedent. There. Commissioner Briggs. Um, could you just describe a little bit more the um, 
in terms of the PUD benefit around the remediation and kind of how that factored into st staff considerations? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, certainly remediation is a benefit to the public. Um, in this case, um, the remediation that's proposed here is the same remediation that was proposed under the previous plan. Um, there was not any additional benefit provided by this remediation over that one. Possibly it could be defined as a public benefit, but um, there wasn't any backup information provided on that, so I would like to know more if, if that was going to be taken into consideration for you know, just what that remediation means, what they're taking out, how much of it, how much it's going to cost, things like that. Um, and uh, the other thing is uh, stormwater. The green roof that's provided is great. We love green roofs. Um, but one of the reasons that it's being provided is to meet the minimum threshold for stormwater uh, um, um, because we, this site it can't utilize infiltration because of the contaminants. Because it can't go through the ground, it's got to go through something else, and they're choosing to do it through the green roof. Um, so it's, that one can't really be counted as an additional beneficial effect of the project um, because it's meeting the standard that's required by code. So um, if, in just a second, um, if this had been the first time that you had seen this project, if you hadn't seen this come in under a, a different um, request previously, um, how would re remediation generally be treated? I mean, is this... I'm trying to understand this kind of from a precedent setting mm -hmm. perspective. And I mean, to, that seems like the largest public benefit with this project. Um, and so um, just trying to under, understand better how you think through this process. Yeah, so certainly if, if um, remediation were proposed as a PUD benefit and more information were supplied about that, um, it would not be me who was reviewing that information, mm -hmm. for one thing. Okay. <laughs> it would be um, somebody from city environmental staff, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, who would give us feedback on, on what's been proposed and, and the merits of that. And, um, uh, and so if this were a first-time project, that's the sort of thing that would be considered. Um, on the other hand, though, you, you, you want to keep in mind that if there's something like parking required as part of the project and they've got to put it somewhere and they choose to put it under the building, at some point, it's tough to call that sort of voluntary remediation. Um, well, no, actually, it's 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 a it's a tightrope that you walk there. Um, what are they going to have to do anyway? And what is really uh, going above and beyond uh, what an average site plan would have to re you know require right. to yeah to provide? Great, thanks. Yeah, would you like to elaborate? We could easily do the project without the green roof. Um, we could, we could handle our stormwater detention in the subterranean tank that was above the level where this uh, remediation had occurred and it could be sealed. We, in fact, did that type of stormwater management on the yard down on South Main Street because that was also a contaminated site. You can't infiltrate because of contamination. You just oversize. You have to store a greater capacity. So, in fact, we evaluated the opportunity of not putting the green roof on, saving the cost of all of that. Mm -hmm and just doing an underground tank. So th th we actually are doing something over and above. Okay. Can you discuss the remediation? Yeah, so, well? the <clears throat> so the contaminated soils are going to be removed down to a level below the foundation system. And then um, below that um, is a, uh, a mat, if you will, of pervious um, material crushed stone, which has ventilation pipes in it. And on top of that, then, you put a, a barrier that's impervious to both the gases that might come out of the soil and also water that might leach down and push the contamination elsewhere. So you've got the barrier reinstalled below the building level, and then <coughs> you construct the footings and the, uh, the building, and then you bring in clean soil to put around the building, plant the new plants in, so that um, <coughs> that contamination um, doesn't find its way off the site anymore because there's no hydrostatic pressure to push it away on the neighboring properties or down a gradient to the, the river. Um, so it, it does offer that uh, benefit to the, to the public. Is this remediation something that would need to be done if this project was um, something entirely different, you know, um, for example? Since I don't understand this process particularly well, if you could talk me through maybe 
another type of project that wouldn't require this remediation. Well, Briefly. so um, <laughs> if we propose non-residential uses, mm -hmm. the levels of remediation are much lower mm -hmm. um, than they are for places where people are going to live. So if we chose a non-residential use, the amount of remediation would be less. Under the existing zoning? Yeah. Because it has a it has a commercial zoning which allows non-residential uses, offices, um, uh, stores, uh, gas stations, um, probably dispensaries. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so it has a non it has it has a, a zoning which per, permits non-residential and therefore a lower level of cleanup standard. Great, thank you. And as we all are doing, thank you for being back here. I know that this is a difficult situation that everybody's in um, and once again for those who have spoken to us tonight um, it's already been said but I, I really think staff is stuck in, a, in an awkward place and I really don't think that they deserve um, any grief for this they're doing their best to implement the policy that has been set by City Council and also to follow those directives and um, this was approved you know you know was, came with the staff recommendation of approval our body has already approved it once. Um, it's being sent back um, to consider under different um, as a PUD, and that comes with the requirements. And so um, I appreciate the very difficult place that they are in. Um, and thank you very much, Jill, for being willing to go through this again as well. <laughs> so, um, and that's not to say that City Council um, wasn't. Um, uh, potentially right to send it back um, if that if they believed that it was um, not the appropriate zoning category however um, I uh, it, it, it seems to me that there's um, enough public benefit in terms of the remediation um, and um, the more information I'm getting on the green roof it sounds like maybe more information would be warranted as it moves forward as well to help elaborate on those benefits um, more substantially as it moves forward to City Council as a whole if it does um, but I staff has a certain calculation that they are required to use um, for affordable housing and so it's unless unless there's some other formula that gets worked out that that seems like what's appropriate and that was the consequence of sending it back Commissioner Gibrandel. Um, two things I would say. One is that I agree that the green roof is not necessary. You could stick it in the tank. And then the other thing that I think we tend to think about green roofs as, you know, this pollinator opportunity <coughs> and that, you know, they're cooler and all that sort of thing, but actually a massive thing that I think we should consider for other um, future potential stormwater management and zoning in the downtown is that they are amazing at insulating. And I would suggest that you figure out what you're saving in terms of your energy cost and um, efficiencies in this next step should it happen because they really are quite incredible for that. And that completely aligns with what we are trying to do for our carbon neutrality goals. And I applaud you for using it on this building and I hope that other people hear this and think about using it on their own because it has so many co-benefits um, that I think are really important. The other piece is that um, I, in my mind, um, feel that the earlier submission of the PUD that came to us in some ways is what should be considered as the date because they they wouldn't if that's really the necessary first step in order for them to be able to move on and that they couldn't have come to like if if that formula had changed before then then that may have had a different result for them and so i feel like it's that and and i i think again we're all in an awkward place <laughs> i echo everything that everybody is saying in terms of supporting staff but also realizing this is this is really difficult and but I also would be curious to know if there truly are other projects that fit this loophole or not which I doubt in terms of just all of the order of events that have happened with this but in my mind I think it's that PUD meeting with us in some ways that really triggers some of this and for me 
I feel like that would be a reason to be able to think about the calculations in a different way because they weren't clarified. So um, I feel like everybody gets to hang their hat in that scenario in some ways because, again, I don't think they would have come before us with, with that change in PUD if that formula had been clarified. And the reason that it was clarified is because it was unclear, people, you know, so it was difficult for people to figure out what to do. And if they had an example and that's what they could use, then that's what they could use. So um, I think this is a good project. I think it totally fits in the area. I will be voting for it tonight, and I feel like there are reasons to do so. Commissioner Sauvé. I'm just going to piggyback off of that, looking at the PUD application itself, which is signed and notarized. It's dated of October 15th that they met with us. So these aren't casual dates either that meet what our uh, pre and post, you know, this new adoption uh, in November is for these calculations. Like there are dates that are part of the process that are benchmarked into this application that we can align with that sets that precedent. And it, maybe it's a small loophole, but as long as there's dates that stick and it's not about people casually saying, oh, we had a meeting at the city, but these are signed and notarized dates as the application, those seem like a pretty strict way to say this was before versus after. So I would be interested uh, in staff kind of reevaluating what those fixed dates are along the way uh, and how they're reviewed. Because I know you can like postmark a postcard whenever you want for, you know, send it today or send it tomorrow, but there are certain dates that are kind of set here. Well, those postmarks are also fe federally stamped, so like those are regulated dates too. Um, so yeah, I, I'm on board with really looking at those dates and figuring out this, the sweet spot of what we are setting for precedent for this and other ones, um, but I'm not interested in the negotiating somewhere between the 88,000 the 279,000, like whatever that equation is, I think that's what I'm interested in seeing happen. Um, so I'm interested, I, I'm voting tonight for this this to move forward. I know that we're at the higher end of the number, but really what I'm, I would be voting for is that the math be applied appropriately for uh, that affordable housing. Um, yeah, I, I do want to say like staff is in, uh, a situation where looking at C1A, you know, was on the table. It it was evaluated to not fit because C1A isn't an appropriate zoning in everywhere in the city. And so the agenda that the city staff had was to then look at what is appropriate and not. It was not to deter any other efforts in the city. I believe that they're just trying to look at things appropriately um, and not in any other sort of context. So uh, I think actually my biggest, que my big question is PUDs. When we talk about this type of zoning or if we're applying zoning for a master plan and if like a, a zoning area in the future through a master plan happened and the PUD matched that, like what's a retroactive PUD falling into a zoning district? Or is it always a PUD? It remains that PUD zoning district until it is rezoned to another PUD zoning district or, or a different standard zoning district. Right. right. If this building were built under a PUD zoning ordinance uh, and then 30 years from now the site was to be redeveloped and someone wanted to clear the land and start over and change the zoning to, you know, R1Z, um, a future zoning district, they could do that. What if they wanted to do, what if through like the master planning process, we put a zoning in this area that would have mapped over the PUD and, and it's a new zoning and so it's say 250% FAR and the setbacks and everything match. And so this property could come back to add an additional floor and then opt to zone in with that building or something. So um, zoning. the same thing would still apply. The PUD zoning district would have to be amended. Um, but the master plan process will figure out future land uses um, and, and densities that are appropriate. Mm -hmm. And if it were different for this area than this PUD, the zoning wouldn't immediately be changed to right. match that. 
So but it would if, be an appropriate, it, like if the master plan called for an appropriate zoning, there's an appropriate zoning category, mm -hmm. this could then rezone into that appropriate thing from a PUD. Um, possibly like by, by undertaking the entire PUD process over again. Right. Yeah. yeah, 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 and that's, yeah. I'm just thinking yeah. of like, why this doesn't fit into any sort of zoning right now. Like if it fit into some sort of zoning category we had and you know why we're at the PUD state mm -hmm. and then what the future of the site is, right? And the precedent of, oh, we're so close to having a zoning category, but we've got a PUD it. And so I'm just thinking, I don't think that's a detriment to moving this project forward. I think it's a good project, but it is kind of one of those circumstances that if we're right on the edge of a zoning category need, needing something and then switching into a PUD, I think that's where staff has led to that denial. Um, so just understanding that more. Commissioner Mills. I was just gonna say, I promise this is the last time, but I, <laughs> this, is, this is why I really appreciate like all the commissioners here because I think you bring up ideas that are really fantastic. One of the things that Commissioner Sauvé's question brought up in my mind, and I think that this is really important to send along, is that if this does get rezoned, if um, if if it ha if you know, regardless of what this body does, right, it's up to city council to decide whether or not to rezone this. But if city council rezones it as the PUD, with the calculation towards affordable housing that they can't afford, nothing can be developed on this except for exactly what we see, because that is one of the things that, for better or for worse, you get with a PUD is only exactly what you see. And so I think that that's it. Um, just let the notes reflect that it's really, really important at, at, it, to know that. Um, and that's not the case in our standard districts. And I think that is among the reasons that our zoning ordinance says it should only be zoned as a PUD if it can't fit in one of the other districts. Because, um, you, Commissioner Sylvia often talks about adaptive reuse, and that's not doable mm -hmm. in the PUD. Commissioner Hammerschmidt. Okay, I just want to extra make sure I understand that. So if we approve this, city council approves this, becomes a PUD, but it stays at 279000 and it's not built, the only thing that could be built is this, unless somebody comes back and restarts this whole process? That's correct. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right, um, okay, going back to this affordable housing disconnect, what was the grace period that you mentioned after November 4th that we're within like just a few days of? So the city council amendment that was adopted on November 4 says, site plan petitions received and accepted by the city that are currently under review by the city as of the publication date of this ordinance shall be exempt from the terms of this ordinance amendment and shall be reviewed under all ordinances in effect as of the publication date of this ordinance. So the ordinance was published on November 7 and the Garnet PUD application was submitted on November 20. Uh, it was uploaded to track it uh, and would have been accepted for review sometime after that. Okay, there was a grace period in the amendment. Yeah. Okay. Um, I do agree with up here though that like we're looking at those dates I mean if that is the break I assume that the 88,000 was assumed by the petitioner because of things that happened while they were in the process so I would also very much support um, going back to look at that and hopefully there's something that can be done about that I also agree that there shouldn't be anything in the middle um, but I would just think since this process was not only started this fall this was I mean I don't I would assume that if you knew that you were gonna go through all of this and had to pay $279,000 when you initially applied for this, things would have been vastly different with this project. Um, and I also, if, if I was not here at the initial um, C1A approval, um, but I followed along and I was here in October and I also think that this was a great project and I would love to find a way to actually get it built. Um, I'm not sure I love the Sparty Green, but it's <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I've been told I can't do Mason Blue either, so. I, that, <laughs> would not, that would not actually look good at all. Um, one thing I wanted to clarify with you, you said you could do a stormwater tank in the garage and then the green roof would be above and beyond that. Are you doing a tank in the garage or no? No. 
No, I said we could do the underground detention tank in lieu of the green mm -hmm. roof. But we're but not did, gonna do if it. If you did both, then it would sort of be that additional benefit. I'm trying to think of ways, I think that there are a public benefits here. I'm just trying to think of like ways that there could be additional benefits if it came to that. Um, and I th the thing that I'm, I guess I'm struggling with a little bit is that we approve a PUD when there's no other zoning category. Staff is saying, but there is another zoning category. The city council is saying, we're not going to use that zoning category. So do we just throw that out that doesn't exist? And now we're saying, because there is no C1A, it has to be a PUD? I guess that's what we're saying. Okay. Okay. This is complicated. And I feel for you guys. Um, but I also plan to support this project. And I really hope there's something we can do about that fee. So um, just a couple of comments for me. Um, so when I got the staff report, I was, you know, obviously when I started reading it and I saw denied, I actually thought I, I was reading the wrong document <laughs> at first. Um, I was really surprised by that. But then further reading the staff report and understanding the rationale behind why they did what they did, um, I understand it and I support it 100%. I, you were put in a really difficult situation, Ms. Thatcher um, and Mr. Leonard, uh, and I completely understand and I support 100% of, uh, of, of the position that you've taken on this. With that said, um, Ms. Anderson, I'm sorry. On behalf of me and me alone, I'm sorry that you're here and you've been here so many times um, and you have my sincere, sincere apologies. Um, what I can say is that I supported this project previously and I will continue supporting this project and I hope that City Council ultimately does support. And I'm gonna think happy thoughts that between now and the time it lands on City Council's uh, table, um, that the affordable housing contribution will be worked out and it will be worked out in the favor of the smaller number. So, but on behalf of me and me alone, I'm sorry. <laughs> Commissioner Briggs. Just a couple more things on the public benefits um, just for the future. Um, given the location of this, um, I don't see, there's a lot of discussion um, in the attachment on the PUD development program about um, sort of the walkability and, and bikeability of the area. Um, that is inherent in the location and so it's very difficult for me to see that as a public benefit. Any development that is put into that location will fit that and, and it's sort of inherent in building these walk walkable, bikeable communities that we have. And so that's sort of the the substance of the benefits, and I think it's the next paragraph which isn't elaborated on as much, where the real substance of this project in terms of being able to justify this as a PUD um, is there. One thing that hasn't been mentioned but that is in the report that I think is notable because we discuss it is that each park car parking space will be prepped for electric vehicle charging stations um, in an effort to encourage use of electric vehicles, which is something that we've been talking about um, requiring in the future, and so that's that's ahead of the curve um, in that. So that is um, extra and something that, that um, is of, of public benefit. So um, thanks for doing that and, and thinking ahead on that respect. Commissioner Abrams. Um, I just wanted to also share that I, that I um, kind of sympathize with all the parties involved in this and it, it's incredibly complex. I've been trying to figure out how to thread the needle and I'm reading over and over again this um, description in the code about the standards for PUD review, uh, if anyone wants page 202 in the um, UDC, but, and, it, and it says, so the beneficial effect for the city shall be one that could not be achieved under any other zoning classification. And as, as far as I can understand it, the one thing that could not be achieved under any other zoning classification other than C1A, which has been denied, is the density, right? So not the green roof, I think not the walkability, I agree with the comment about that, um, not the remediation, those things could be achieved under another zoning classification. Uh, and then it goes on to say, and it shall be one that is not required to be provided under any existing standard regulation or ordinance. So that would also take affordable housing out, <laughs> I think as a public benefit. So I feel like what I'm left with is the density and in my mind that's enough um, and I plan to support the project. but. If I'm, if I'm maybe 
trying to offer city council also a way to thread the needle or some ideas about how they might um, conceive of the public benefit, I would argue that the, that the density is one because we have a housing shortage and we need more housing. Thanks. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's approved. I Thank love you. you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, moving on to uh, item 9B, an amendment to Chapter 55, Unified Development Code, Sections 5.29.6 Site Plans, 5.29.7 Area Plans, and 5.29.8 Required Plan Information. Um, we will head to Ms. Thatcher for staff report. This one is blissfully straightforward. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're taking the requirements for site plans out of the site plan section, the requirements for what shows up on area plans out of the area plan section, all of the little um, here and there references to special exception uses and what they're required to show. We're putting it all in one new section, um, 5.28.8, required plan information, with a new handy dandy table telling you exactly which sheets you'll need to put with which site plans. It does not change any of the code requirements. It's strictly a reshuffling of the existing information. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to open up the public hearing on this item. If anyone in the audience wishes to address the Planning Commission, please step up to the podium, state your name and address for the record, and you'll have up to three minutes to address the Planning Commission. Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing and I will read the motion. The Ann Arbor, the Ann Arbor City Planning Commission hereby recommends that the Mayor and City Council approve the February, tw February 4th, 2020 draft amendments to Chapter 55 Unified Development Code sections, Section 5.29.6 site plan and, and 5.29.7 area plans and add a new section 5.29.8 required plan information to reorganize code requirements for all types of site plans and area plans. Moved by Commissioner Mills, seconded by Commissioner Sauve. Uh, discussion? Commissioner Briggs. Just a quick question. Um, I understand it's a reorganization and it's not changing anything, but if we, I think this came up before, but just to refresh my memory, if we wanted to change any of the standards that, for example, went into the transportation piece of it or something, how would that, what would that process look like? Uh, it would be similar to what this one is going through. Mm -hmm. You know, it would go through the, uh, the Ordinance Review Committee and then it would come to this body and then for a recommendation to City Council. Um, it would certainly probably have a lot more discussion, <laughs> but um, otherwise. Are you aware of, by, by chance, of anything that's come out of the transportation plan update or any of, that, any of the discussions um, that might inform whether the requirements that we currently have are the appropriate ones? Uh, I'm not aware of those discussions, okay. no. Okay, no. thanks. Commissioner Gibrandel. A heartfelt thank you to reorganization of all of this. It was so scattered and confusing before, and as somebody who's used it on the other side, it's just so wonderful to have it all in one place, so clearly organized. So Good. thank you for your efforts. Great. Commissioner Abrams. Um, I just, I think, is it supposed to be 529.8? Yes. So the some. document that we received says 5228.8, required plan information, which, yep, you're right. Great. Okay, we'll fix that before it gets to council. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's approved. Thank you. All right, moving on to 1780 Sayu Church Road annexation and zoning uh, for city council approval. Uh, we'll begin with a staff report. Uh, this is a very straightforward rezoning and um, annexation. Sorry, it's sorry. I don't mean to be harping on the straightforward stuff. <laughs> Just trying to get my slideshow to play, but my mouse is, is behaving badly. I, no, go ahead and try. Um, I'll just talk about it. Um, this is a, a 
let's see, it's a 0.74 acre site um, that's currently in the township on Sio Church Road, east of South Maple, to the Mallets Creek watershed, and there's a 2,547 square foot house on the lot. It's proposed to be rezoned to R1C, single family dwelling district. Thank you. And you'll see that it's got a house, it's a pretty large lot, all around it is residential, and the zoning map is kind of remarkable in that every single thing on here is mm -hmm. R1C <laughs> until you get down to the public land. Um, the West Area Plan recommends residential use for the site. Um, 50 feet of the right of way for Sio Church Road, as measured from the center line, will have to be granted um, to the city in a manner determined by the city attorney's office. That's pretty standard. A lot of township lots were drawn right to the center line of the road instead of outside of the right of way. Um, and staff supports the proposed R1C zoning because it's consistent with the surrounding land uses and recommendations of the West Area Plan. Um, at this time, I'd like to open up a public hearing. Anyone in the audience who wishes to address the Planning Commission, you may step up to the podium, state your name and address for the record, and you'll have up to three minutes to address the Planning Commission. Hello. Um, I think I'm the petitioner, though. Um, <laughs> okay. So. Sure. Uh, I'm Sarah Lorenz. Uh, my husband and I own this property, and uh, we had been told that this would be annexed automatically in August under, uh, with a large number of parcels uh, that were supposed to be automatically annexed and then all kinds of interesting things happened where people apparently uh, put up a huge hue and cry about that happening to theirs and we were looking forward to ours being annexed automatically and free um, and so instead it was not um, annexed and so now we will pay the $1,500 and hope that it will be annexed now so that we can build a house. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else who wishes to address the Planning Commission in regards to this item? Seeing no one, I will close the public hearing and I'll read the motion. The Ann, Arbor, the Ann Arbor City Planning Commission hereby recommends that the Mayor and City Council approve the Capozo Annexation and R1C Single Family Dwelling District Zoning. Moved by Commissioner Mill, seconded by Commissioner Abrams. We are in discussion. Commissioner Mills, or I'm sorry, Commissioner Gibrandel. No, no. I beat you to it. <laughs> um, so we got an interesting <coughs> correspondence around this thing in terms of the, the, the nature of the true property line here. And I'm just wondering from staff, you know, with these annexations, do they do a real deal boundary survey? with this or is this something that is just kind of taken off the city GIS because with the real deal no. boundary survey you're going to know where that property line actually is. They do do a real boundary survey and the fence did show up on the neighbor's property who wrote the letter. Okay so is is what the neighbor saying is he correct in that it looks like they own more property than what kind of appears if you're sitting there on the land because this fence often sits right on the property line? Yes, that's very likely. Okay. Yeah. Um, I haven't been out there myself, but yeah, if, if the fence is too far back on the neighbor's property, then um, uh, Brett Leonard corresponded with the neighbors um, about things that they could do to try to address that and working with the property owners and, and coming to some resolution about either who owns the fence or moving it or, you know, I, I'm not sure what they desired the outcome to be. But it's but it's not it's not that there's more property that they're somehow getting by having a fence on the neighbor's property. Right. So, if you wouldn't mind coming back up again, so you're aware of this discrepancy that the neighbor is bringing up then. Um, so we purchased the property on a land contract, and uh, the people that we purchased it from told us that there was an older complaint from a neighbor about a fence. And so I don't, do you know when that correspondence was? Oh, it was just, there more recent? It just came in like today or yesterday. Okay, yeah. so that's new okay. to me. I, we had known that there was some, um, but we, I think we can take care of that when we do any construction. There's a very, very old septic field that is failing that is going to need to be removed. So there's gonna be a fair amount of work that needs to be done there, so I'm sure we can come to some resolution about the fence. Okay, because there's, there's oh, the, the nature of what this, the neighbor is um, questioning is that 
an, a previous owner was cantankerous and that kind of required them to build a fence that was really on their property instead of kind of on the line because he asserted that he owned that, which he probably didn't, it sounds like, according to this, but it would be nice to be able to have this kind of settled in terms of what the real deal property boundary yeah, is. Yeah, we had a stake survey done. Um, so there are stakes that was just done um, recently. Okay, so you're aware of where your corners yeah. are and all that sort of thing. Okay, yeah. so that, we have the new we survey sure. with the stakes yep. and so we can um, figure out a solution with the neighbor. Okay, about the fence. Right. that's what I just wanted to have clarified. Commissioner Mills. Perfect. So I, thanks uh, for if the neighbors right, is watching this on TV, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> thanks for writing. We do read these things. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and one of the things that was in that letter was talking about um, whether if there are buildings on the lot that are non-conforming, right? Because there's different ordinances in the township versus the city. Just as an understanding of how, how that works, I'm going to put it in layman's terms, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. They become non-conforming. Like this is not the only situation where we annex land into the city where you know there might be a garage that's too close to the property line, and so there are rules that our zoning ordinance spells out about at what point like you can rebuild in that same footprint or you can't effectively, and so that's just something to keep in mind. A general like for everybody's benefit like just because you have it there now doesn't mean you can totally tear it down and rebuild it in the very same place so um, is that a fair a, yes. like description mm -hmm. of non-conforming mm -hmm. buildings okay. yep Commissioner Briggs I just want to say thanks for coming tonight and paying the city fifteen hundred dollars <laughs> sitting through a nice two-hour meeting on the Garnet and Welcome to the city. <laughs> so I have one quick question, Ms. Thatcher. Um, can this property be divided based on if it's own R1C? I don't believe it can. Let's see. The lot area is 32,103 square feet. Oh, I don't, can we look it up? It's just out of curiosity more yeah, than anything else. Yeah, let me, let me keep, keep going and I'll look it up. Sorry. All right. Well, that was my only question, so <laughs> <laughs> I could keep going for, for a while. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to? Welcome to the city. <laughs> see. So the minimum lot size for R1C districts is 7,200 square feet with a minimum lot width of 60 feet. Mm -hmm. um, this lot width is 137 feet. Um, so, yeah, you could conceivably divide the lot. Obviously, you'd have to tear down the house that's in the middle of it, but yeah, that's a possibility. Well, uh, so it could become two lots, is that correct? It could become with probably more than that yeah. if you... With 60, 60. 120, eh, if you have an easement for access for rear lots, you could maybe get four. Okay. Maybe, maybe. All right, further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's approved. Thank you. All right, we are now at audience participation. This is an opportunity that anybody in the audience who wishes to address the Planning Commission about anything at all, including what we've discussed today or anything else, you can step up to the podium, state your name and address for the record, and you can address the Planning Commission for up to three minutes. Seeing no one, we'll move on to Commission Proposed Business. Do you have a motion to adjourn? Moved by Commissioner Mills, seconded by Commissioner Sauvé. We are adjourned. Thank you.